Hej och välkommen och det är morgondateringen den 11.11 .11 vi talar om här då. Och jag vill börja åter påminna er om att Gud visste ju vad som skulle komma. Jag hade ju en profetisk dröm för något eller några år sedan där jag var på en plats och helt plötsligt så förvandlades den här platsen och det dök upp skyltar överallt. Det var alltså samma antisemitiska skyltar som var 1939 och början där när Hitler kom till makten. Och jag skulle gå igenom två folkskaror och de spottade och hytte med näven och hotade mig och allt det här. Men jag kom igenom och då hörde jag en röst tala till mig från himlen och sa de har hatat mig utan orsak. Återigen så ser vi alltså hur Messias, Jesus Kristus, kopplas till det judiska folket. Och det kommer vi inte ifrån. Det kan vi inte göra om du är född på nytt. Då kommer du inte ifrån det, utan då är Messias, den judiska Messias av judastam, han är alltså kopplad till ett förbund där du också är med. Precis som han har lovat judarna att vara med och i slutet av den här tidsåldern föda den på nytt i allt större utsträckning och det är precis där vi lever i nu. Amos 5.21 ska vi ta och börja med. Jag hatar era fester. Jag föraktar dem. Jag tål inte era högtider. Ty om ni än offrar åt mig både brännoffer och matoffer så finner jag ingen glädje i dem. Era gemenskapsoffer av gödda kalvar vill jag inte se. Ta bort ifrån mig dina sångers buller. Ditt stränga spel vill jag inte höra. Låt rätten flöda fram som vatten och rättfärdigheten som en ständigt rinnande ström. Ja, kära vänner, det här handlar ju om två saker då. Det handlar ju om att göra och att se ut att göra. <laughs> om Herren inte får våra hjärtan så är faktiskt allt orent som vi gör i hans namn, med andra ord. Vi kan göra mycket i hans namn, men i själva verket så sker ju det här i vårt eget namn. Det är ju egentligen vad de här verserna här handlar om. Och det ser vi ju då i Matteus 7 till exempel, att de gjorde ju mycket i Herrens namn. Men det var ju inte i Herrens namn, utan det var ju i deras eget namn. Och likadant ser det ju i uppenbarelseboken till Laodicea. Man trodde man var andlig. Men det var man alltså inte och likadant med jungfrurna och talenterna och allt det här. Det talar om precis samma sak. Vi kan alltså ha fester och gudstjänster och konferenser. Och det ser ut som om det är i Herrens namn. Men det är alltså i vårt eget namn. Sker det inga andliga offer som Herren vill ha så är det i vårt eget namn. Och det, det förstår vi ju själva att Paulus säger ju det att vad vill Herren ha? Jo, han vill ha våra hjärtan. Han vill att vi ska lägga oss som ett levande offer på altaret. Om vi inte gör det så blir ju till och med lovsången falsk. Hur vacker den låter i våra ö öron. Och så låter rättfärdigheten flöda fram. Det är ju anden, alltså Gärningar som är drivna av den helige ande. Idag är det 19 år sedan ledaren för den palestinska nationen Yasser Arafat dog. Idag väntas en stor konferens med La Arab ledarna statschefer om kriget i Gaza i Saudiarabien. Och idag klockan 15 väntas Isbollas ledare Hassan Nasrallah. Hålla ett tal med anledning av martyrdagen. Som ni förstår så är det ju viktigt vad han säger den här gången. När vi är på gränsen till ett krig i norr också. Vi ska visa några klipp här också. Vi börjar med klipp 1. Det är ju en 
eh, väckelse som ni vet i Iran. Och Iran har ju varit vänner till Israel i alla år. Och vi hade en iransk kille som bodde på Beteskeppet, eller <laughs> kille, pensionär var han. Och han berättade att eh, förr i tiden i Iran så älskar ju vi Israel. Det är ju det som finns i hjärtat egentligen. Så kom ju den här <hör> kulturrevolutionen då och förde in islam. Och vi ser ju vad det är för makt bakom. Det är ju detta hat. Det är precis som nazismen. Och pastor Lazarus Jegnahar eller Jegnazar, han är grundare och ordförande i Transform Iran. Det är alltså en organisation som sprider evangeliet i Iran. Han sa att samarbeten håller på att utvecklas och han varnar för att Hamas, Talibanerna och Hisbollah och IS skulle komma samman. Det skulle ju bli en fruktansvärt hot mot Israel. Så vi får nu se vad han, Hisbollahs ledare här, säger idag. Ja, det är ju en stor varning då för västmakterna och alla demokratier vad som händer nu här om de skulle gå samman. En sån konflikt som är katastrofal skulle uppsluka hela regionen. Ja, det här kan ju till och med vara en bild på vad som kommer att hända under den stora vedermöden. Att de här organisationerna samlar på sig en massa vapen och sen går till attack då samtidigt. Ja, han varnar här att det här modiska kaoset, den här anden bakom som vi ser som är antisemitisk kommer alltså att spridas som en farsot över hela världen. Ja, klipp två då, det är en judisk professor som heter Alan Dershowitz. Han säger att Barack Obama är fiende till det judiska folket. Och han ångrar till och med att han bjöd in honom till sitt födelsedagskalas. Ja, Elvor och jag har ju aldrig eh, förstått den här Obama. Han talar ju dubbla tungor hela tiden. Han eh, passar ju upp sig för vad han säger. Han är som en orm. Och så slutar vi då med de här kartorna vart kriget håller på. Och då kan vi ju säga att innan vi gick och la oss igår så var det ju faktiskt världens eldgivning runt det här sjukhuset ni vet. Som man talar om här då. Och nu kommer de här klippen då. Gud välsigna er och i Jesu namn så hörs vi vidare här. Uppdateringar på den här telegramsidan och på vår egen hemsida. Gud välsigna er alla. Shalom. You have an incredibly unique story having lived in Iran, you know, serving in the military there. You have, I think, some insight onto what is like what it is like to be inside that country. There's a lot going on in the world right now. Let's start with your story. Tell us a little bit about your early years, your upbringing and what it was like in Iran. Well, I was born in the time of the Shah of Iran and uh, it was the second in line of the Pahlavi dynasty. His father, Reza Shah the Great, he started that dynasty and outseated the Qajar dynasty, which had been going on for a long time. And extremely, you know, despotic and extremely corrupt and very backward thinking. So the Pahlavi dynasty came in, you know, with modernization, opening up. And Reza Shah did something very incredible. He says, now women should not be forced to be covered under this Islamic uh, code of hijab. He started it, and actually some Iranians fled to the southern Arabic small enclaves, not willing to give away this hijab. But Reza Shah thought that this hijab is going to subjugate women, and he wanted to modernize Iran, he wanted to open up, and he did that. Then, cutting a long story short, his son took uh, on, and the country was booming with every possibility. Entrepreneurs were flooding in, There were 24,000 American servicemen working in Iran, huge industries, Raytheon, you name it, Boeing, General Dynamic. And uh, to be honest, I start because we were not a rich family and my father used to work in the Bible Society for close to 40 years, 39 years to be precise. I wanted to study English, but there was no money that was for the 
avant-garde and super rich. But my one of my uncles were working for a non-commissioned officers club as a chef. I said, listen, would you take me? I will do anything. He says, listen, you're only 14 years old. It's a tough work. I said, I will wash the dishes. I will clean. And they employed me for one month. And then it carried on for three months. And then I did it for many summers. That's where in the non-commissioned officers club in Iran, I picked up my English. And it was exciting because then I took some books, some literature. And uh, grilling in Iran was, uh, Islam was uh, a very happy, coexistent religion with everything else. And I remember one street, for instance, where I used to walk a lot of times, Pahlavi Street. There was a mosque, there was a church, and there was the Kukpa Kabbana, a striptease joint, all living kind of the uh, modus vivandi, you know, we're very happy living together. If you wanted to practice your Islam, you could go to a mosque. If you wanted to practice your Christianity, go to a church. If you want to do all sorts of other boozing, etc., there is a striptease joint. All are equally permitted. Then, of course, the revolution happened 43 years ago, and everything turned around. Five million people welcomed Ayatollah Khomeini, and he came and he brought the true Islamic mandate in Iran. What this true Islamic mandate is, it's yes, yet to be prescribed clearly, but many Muslim scholars have been debating it for two, three years. What is a pure Islamic mandate? And I would say in a very short way is Islam has got a habit of either you subjugate everyone to become a Muslim or they have to pay a limi or a, a, a fine to be able to operate and live in an Islamic country without without being subjugated to torture and that. And this is going on all the time in the Middle East. And Khomeini brought this Islamic mandate, revived it in a very powerful way. And that has been taking on many regions of the Iran area or the Levant area. You know, when you look at what is going on right now, Obviously, you described a very different situation in Iran before to what we currently have now. What is the motivation when you hear things like, we want Israel off the map, we want Israel gone, when you see that they are collaborating and funding and working with Hamas and Hezbollah and other organizations, what is driving that? Yeah. Uh, Lily, to be honest, I see a lot of sensationalism in Christian journalism towards the Hamas situation and Israel situation. I like what uh, uh, your ex, you know, uh, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger brought in as a real politic. The real politic is that there is a deep bitterness in the descendants of Ishmael. But this, this deep, deep uh, you know, bitterness, sometimes it just fades away and sometimes it's hypered back. Now, Khomeini came and hyped it back to an unprecedented level. For a deep bitterness in his own life, Khomeini says Israel should be obliterated from planet Earth. Now, we, we can speak for hours and, and we can dissect why he did that. And this has been going on as a result. Iran became a fermentation ground for all those people who had a bitter Islamic mandate against Christianity and Judeo-Christian values. If you look in Yemen, if you look in Iraq, if you look in North Africa, wherever, in Mindanao, Philippines, I mean, nobody is, you know, uh, away from this hand of Iranian, you know, uh, uh, attitude of obliterating Israel. They have very much trouble in Bangladesh, in Pakistan. And some countries like India, they said, listen, hands off. You cannot bring trouble to the Muslims in our country. But uh, the deep bitterness is against Judeo-Christian values. And anybody who wants to, especially they come from Islamic background to Christianity, Christian faith, they're absolutely going bonkers about that. And this is why in Iran, over a million people who have come to Christ, every single one of them has to pay a price one way or another. So I would say Hamas, who has been protected and mentored and coached and directed and equipped by Iran and another country, small country, which is an ally, sadly, of the United States, Qatar. Qatar is now housing and protecting Haniyeh 
Ismail Haniyeh, who was the leader of Hamas for many years. And uh, so, but by far the you know the greatest mentor, coach, uh, and uh, and uh, trainer and financier of Hamas organization is Iran. And where they will stop? Only God knows where they will stop. I think this destruction is going to carry on. You cannot get the deep root of bitterness away. You can destroy buildings. And I, I'm not going to enter into politics why Israel is doing what they are doing in Gaza. And the whole world is going uproar. And this is inhumane. They don't say what is inhumane. What has happened in Iran for the last 43 years is inhumane. Iran is gassing its own schools, good schools. They're gassing them, killing them. Nobody says this is inhuman. Their, their own people. Their, their own they're, people are under oppression. And my friend Billy, if they're <clears throat> doing it, their own girls in the schools and they're silencing everyone. They said, none of your business. We'll do what we want. They're killing, raping, murdering. Mm -hmm. They have been doing it all around for not 100, not 1,000, tens of thousands of university students. Even yesterday or two days ago, they arrested more university students because they dared to show some tiny bits of hair when they were attending university. So this country and these rulers will not stop in any way but to ferment more trouble. And that so, is what will happen. Let me ask you this, because I know that you've said a couple of things, and I have some of your statements in front of me here, and I want to share them and get go a little deeper on them. You talked about the plague of bitterness, which you just spoke about. You also talked about the fact that if this is left unchecked, you know, it's not just about obliterating Israel. It will come in to subjugate everyone, not just Israel. You also pose this question, and this is where I want to focus. What happens if Hamas, Taliban, Hezbollah, and ISIS join forces, which is a terrifying thought, and yet these groups have very similar ideologies or, or even goals. Talk a little bit about that. How likely is that? Is that already happening? And what do you fear? Oh, it is happening. I, I can't go into details of that. Uh, I don't feel safe even in United mm -hmm. Kingdom where I live. It's just God's providence and God's protection that I'm able to survive so far. Uh, the Iranians, if this, and they're, they're fermenting this trouble and this bitterness among all these people that you said, Hashtashabi, the Houthis, etc. But they're now drawing people from Mindanao, Philippines. There are Taliban who says, now listen, give us an open way. We want to get to our brothers in Gaza. And there are people in Pakistan who want to do that. I think Iran has, for the last 43 years, fermented bitterness and, and hatched on this beehive. It's not a beehive, it's a wasp. Uh, bees are good, you know, little creatures, but the wasp, the wasp nest is there. And if this wasp nest is broken, it's enough that one of the cruise missiles from Hezbollah region attacks Tel Aviv. This time it will not be a few hundred, it will be tens of thousands. Israel cannot stop. The American fleet are there manning the whole situation. But I think you're very a hairline crack away from the whole region burning in an inferno. You know, and, and that is that is the terrifying piece of this puzzle. I'm going to ask you a question, and it's going to seem maybe silly on the surface because of being believers and knowing that there's a spiritual realm. But I want to get your reaction because a lot of the world is looking at this as a purely political, temporal issue. How much of this is deeply spiritual in your view? I think it's absolutely deeply spiritual. It's the darkness over light. And, you know, there is a lot of exaggeration from the right side, from the left side, as I said, let's not let's avoid the sensational politics and talk about real politics. This is not a matter of obliterating Israel from planet Earth, which they cannot do it. Hitler tried to do it. He didn't succeed. Where is Hitler? He's gone with the history. And he's going to pay the price, staying in hell forever and ever in eternity. I think this obliterating of Israel is going exactly against the biblical mandate. When you look at Ezra chapter 1, by the way, when you think about the Bible besides Jews and Arabs and Palestinians, there is a big chunk of Iran there, history of Iran in Ezra, Nehemiah, Daniel, Esther, you know, the Cyrus and Darius. And Ezra says that the king of Iran, the spirit of God, invoked something in him that he had taken a lot of jewelry from the temple from the Nebuchadnezzar's palace and gave it back. He says, go and restore your temple. 
I think this darkness from the Ayatollahs is totally opposite side of what God did through Cyrus. Go and build your temple. Now, they don't want to build a temple. They want, they don't want to destroy the temple, but they want to destroy the remnants of everyone who had been a part and parcel of that. So this is going on for centuries. This bitterness will not go away. Now, the question I've been posed in the last few weeks by different reporters is, what is the verdict? I think to wake up because these guys are already sending from Ecuador, from Venezuela, revolutionary guards into your country in the United States. They're doing it. I mean, if I'm aware, I'm sure your intelligence community is aware of that. They are not going to stay here and say, okay, you bomb Gaza and destroy it and you bring their American fleet. They will do everything to destabilize. These people enjoy destabilizing. These people enjoy jihad, which is a fight, because the, there is a deep animosity with Judeo-Christian values. And, you know, as you said, spiritual in nature, one of the things that has shocked a lot of people watching the crisis with Israel and Hamas and all that's going on are these claims and reports of Hamas using human beings as shields, using Palestinians as human shields, you know, engaging in this behavior that seems so foreign to a Western mind, but obviously to a Christian mind, right? That you would, mm -hmm. that you would use other people in this way. Can you reflect on, on any of that at all? Because that, that seems to be, it's just otherworldly in so many ways. Well, their worldview, which is Hamas, and also let's let's be very uh, plain about it, their mm -hmm. mentors, which is Islamic Republic of Iran, mainly, uh, they have mentored them, they have coached them into this, that we have to we have to fight, we have to subjugate, we cannot live coexisting together in peaceful way. Either you fight to subjugate, and we are killed and destroyed. There is no coexistence. In this type of Islamic theology, there is no peaceful coexistence, and I think the West has to understand it. Today is Hamas, tomorrow is Hezbollah, they will create another Taliban, ISIS. It is constant because they cannot accept peaceful coexistence with Judeo-Christian values. It's not only Western values, but their animosity is against any biblical value. Now, where, where this will end? I think this will end in an absolute Armageddon. It, might, we, it is coming towards us. But believe my sadness is not what Satan is doing because this is already uh, prophesied in the scripture that this will happen. My sadness is what will happen to wake up the church. What will have to happen to prevent the church into forgetting its own pity, you know, introvert attitude and come say, listen, let's join hand. This denomination, that denomination, it is far bygone the time of even evangelizing. This is a time that we are nearing the end time and we need to wake up and pray together so that God can perform his own will into the humankind in this region of the world. Final question for you, and I could talk to you for hours because your story is, is so fascinating, uh, but how can we pray? Because you just mentioned that we need to come together and pray. What are the prayer points, the biggest ones in your view right now? Well, I think that, you know, uh, having said this kind of doom and gloom situation, I want to tell the listeners mm -hmm. that millions of Iranians have turned to Christ. And no one ministry or no one organization can take credit for that. That is absolute, tragically false. That's not possible. In the, in the book of Isaiah, it says, a nation which didn't seek me, I stretched my hand. And it's not only for the nation of Israel. Iranians, really, and my dear listeners, brothers and sisters in Christ, they were not interested. When I was growing up in Iran, no one person was interested to hear the gospel. We were trying to talk with people. People say, get out of here. Go and work. Lazy smuggling because we are trying to distribute tracts. But what happened, the Islamic Republic was formed. All of a sudden, hundreds then thousands, then tens of thousands flocked towards the church. And as a result, the Islamic authorities got very furious and they started obliterating, destroying, closing down all the churches. They didn't know that God has given us the te technology of satellite. And because of satellite preaching and ministry and social media, millions have turned to Christ. I think we will have an opportunity. And I'm not afraid of that. Iran will open up for the gospel in unprecedented way. 
I think before the end time and Armageddon, tens of thousands of Iranian missionaries full of the Holy Spirit will march into Turkey, into Yemen, into all these Arabic countries and say, listen, this is not revolutionary guys. This is a revolution through Jesus Christ. We are here not to kill and destroy, but we are here to pray, pray, heal, and amend and attend to their wound. This will happen. Please believe into that. And accelerating this will be the united prayer of Christians. Not to be afraid of what Hamas and Hezbollah will do. I think they will do what Satan has asked them to do. But the question is, are we ready to do what God has asked to do? To go on our knees, pray for healing of our land. Well, I thank you for taking the time. Your organization, Transform Iran, you're doing work on the ground, um, reaching hearts on the ground there um, in that country. Appreciate you taking the time to come on today. And thank you very much. And when we meet in the 100,000 seat stadium in Tehran, Billy, I will interview there and you will hear the singing and worship of many ethnic Iranians. That day will be upon us very soon. Oh. You can't make those kinds of comparisons, Barack Obama. And I have to tell you, what you did is just despicable. It's beneath contempt. And um, and whatever respect I had for you, I have absolutely lost. Fortunately, so have many other Americans uh, lost respect for you. And I'm hoping that you have no influence on the current administration, future Democratic administrations, and that your lack of morality ends up in the in the dustbin of history where where it belongs. And so I'm ashamed that I was your friend. I'm ashamed that I invited you to my birthday party. I'm ashamed that I accepted your invitation to the Oval Office. And I'm ashamed that I allowed you to fool me into thinking that you actually uh, supported Israel. You do not. Nobody who has any love for Israel in their heart would ever make the kind of obscene, obnoxious comparison you made between murder, rape, kidnapping, burning of, of, of civilians, and, and a disputed occupation that could have ended over and over again if the Palestinians had only uh, accepted the deals offered by President Clinton and by others in the American administration, not by you. You didn't do anything to help the peace process, but Clinton did, and, and Trump did, and, and others did, but not you. Um, all you did was condemn Israel. Don't count on me and my support. Um, uh, you, you have been an enemy to justice, an enemy to Israel, an enemy to the Jewish people, and an enemy to decency. I'm embarrassed that I ever thought it as highly as you as I obviously did. I was fooled by you. I'll never be fooled again to unite the northern and southern lines by making great gains on the coastal strip. I can say that the Israeli forces have made many major advances with tanks in this process. In addition, despite the strong resistance of terrorist groups, the advance plan continues rapidly. There are tunnels, groups affiliated with terrorist organizations, and many traps everywhere in the coastal strip. Therefore, the rapid advance of the Israeli forces in the region is quite successful. In the process, the critical terrorist stronghold was officially surrounded and the chief commanders of the terrorist groups were targeted by the Israeli defense forces. Now the leadership and coordination of the resistance groups will collapse very quickly. With the targeting of these two senior terrorist organization leaders, three major operations have officially begun. Firstly, with the first light of the morning, Israeli forces completed their preparations at the point you see on the map. As you can see, the tanks and the infantry are located on the coastline. North of the point where the tanks are located is the Ash Shati camp. The main target of the Israeli army is the Ash Shati camp, the strongest point of the terrorist groups. However, it would be very risky to attack this camp directly. For this reason, instead of moving directly to the north, the Israeli army quickly made a major advance towards the east. The first target in the south was the headquarters of the Sabra Battalion of the terrorist organization. In this process, two senior terrorist leaders were neutralized, while a large number of anti-tank missile systems and ammunition were captured. After the raid on the headquarters, the Israeli army made a sudden turn to the north, parallel to the Ashati camp. Before we move on to the most important operation of the day, I would like to make an important mention at the beginning of the video. The target is the strongest stronghold of terrorist groups. In this process, it was observed that the Israeli forces requested air support before taking action. With the request for air support, dozens of fighter jets were mobilized and many attacks were carried out on the point you can see on the map. As a result of the attacks, the resistance of the militant groups in the region was largely broken. With the end of the airstrikes, the major ground operation officially began. 
First of all, I want you to keep in mind the area where the attack was organized because the operation started simultaneously on two main lines and the two operations are linked to each other. With the mobilization of Israeli tanks, the terrorist stronghold began to be hit one after the other. In this process, terrorist groups deployed in the region tried to respond to Israeli tanks. But the tanks, using the advantage of armor, created a big rift in the area and very fierce clashes broke out. With the movement of the tanks, most of the points where terrorist organizations opened fire were identified and Israeli infantry entered the area. As the intensity of the clashes increased, Israeli forces managed to break through the terrorist organization's defense line and reached the area. The terrorist organization's stronghold was surrounded in this process. As a result of the sudden and rapid advance, militant groups broke out of the encirclement. After prolonged clashes, the militant groups were pushed back and the fighting slowed down. However, the area is considered as the most important point of the Hamas terrorist organization. Therefore, militant groups are trying every way to break the siege. However, the area is completely under control. In a short time, a clearing operation will be launched against the terrorist groups organizing attacks in the surrounding area. At the beginning of the video, I told you that the two points where simultaneous operations were carried out were very important and interconnected. In this process, Israeli forces carried out the most important step of the major operation on the northern line of the coastal strip. In order not to put their infantry at risk, the Israeli forces first want to disrupt the coordination of terrorist groups. For this purpose, the operation launched today targeted the commander of the Nuba company and the platoon commander of the militant groups. With the covert operation organized by the special forces, a group of 20 soldiers infiltrated the operation area secretly. The soldiers of the special forces disguised themselves and reached the operation point in coordination. After this process, Israeli tanks detected that the special forces were advancing and the tanks started to advance suddenly. As the tanks approached the area, the first major attack began. The militants in the vicinity focused on the tanks in this process and the opportunity for the special forces to advance was created. Four groups of five soldiers from the special forces entered the area where the commanders of the terrorist group were located. It was reported that very fierce clashes started after this process. The attack lasted for about one hour and all the chief commanders of the Iranian-backed groups were neutralized. In order for the special forces to leave the area, tanks and new troops moved towards the operation point. While it was observed that armored vehicles entered the operation point in this process, the soldiers of the special forces who completed the operation were successfully removed from the region. With the success of this operation, the operation started to the stronghold of the Hamas terrorist organization on the southern line. With the destruction of the point where the militant groups were coordinated and their commanders, I can say that the Israeli forces managed to surround the terrorist stronghold very quickly. The siege changed direction very abruptly and focused on two points, the Ash Shati camp and the center of Gaza. The speed and intensity of the operation increased considerably as Israeli forces controlled critical points and neutralized senior officials. As the progress shifted to the terror points on the center line, if the siege is successful in this way, I think that operations will start from different points. The siege of the critical coastal strip will probably lead to a shift of operations towards the Beit Hanun area. First, there will be an operation through the coastal strip into the center of Gaza. Second, if Beit Hanun is controlled, two operations will start from this area. Then I think many front lines will be opened. I can say that the siege is about to be completed. The tension continues to increase day by day. We have come to the end of another video. And Israel is reporting that for the first time ever in their history, they had to use a long range air defense missile to shoot down one of the missiles that were fired at Israel from Yemen yesterday. If you missed my updates from yesterday, I recommend you watch them. I talked about the missiles that Yemen fired towards Israel yesterday. They fired multiple long-range missiles at Israel, okay? And this was confirmed by the Yemeni Armed Forces spokesperson. So Israel had to use an Arrow 3 missile for the first time ever in their history to intercept one of these missiles fired from Yemen. 
Guys, do you think that Yemen has the money to build these types of missiles? Of course they don't. They're getting these missiles from somewhere, probably from Iran. And this is just the beginning. Yemen is going to continue to fire these missiles at Israel. This is just the beginning, guys. They literally just started firing missiles at Israel. It's just going to get worse and worse as time goes on. I want to read to you a little bit about this Arrow 3 missile that Israel used. So the Arrow 3 missile provides exo-atmospheric interception of ballistic missiles, which is during the space flight portion of their trajectory including ICBMs carrying nuclear, chemical, biological, or conventional warheads. With divert motor capability, its kill vehicle can switch directions dramatically, allowing it to pivot to see approaching satellites. The missile's reported flight range is up to 1,500 miles. According to the chairman of the Israeli Space Agency, Arrow 3, may serve as an anti-satellite weapon which would make Israel one of the world's few countries capable of destroying orbiting satellites. So guys, this is literally a missile that can fly all the way into space 1,500 miles to intercept ICBMs, okay? So they're literally using their best air defenses now to stop these ballistic missiles that are flying at them. Okay, this thing has a range of 1,500 miles and can shoot down satellites. So they had to use one of those to take down one of these ballistic missiles that were fired from Yemen. Okay, these are ballistic missiles, guys. We're not talking cruise missiles here. Okay, ballistic missiles. These are medium-range ballistic missiles that fly up into space. Okay, these are the same type of missiles that North Korea tests. Uh, on a regular basis. And these are the type of missiles that are being fired at Israel now. And the media is so quiet about it. They don't care about anything except Donald Trump. That's all they care about. And his 100 felony charges. Okay, that's all they're talking about. They're not talking about Yemen firing multiple ballistic missiles at Israel now. This is very, very serious. Okay.